the interesting thing with the uh, FSIN guide is, and I had this conversation with Will last year when I started sort of thinking about looking at these indicators, is that it, it really focuses on those indicators that, that are most commonly used at the policy level or programmatic level. So what I'm going to show here for biomarkers and for clinical assessment or even for IYCF are not necessarily the, uh, the entire set of indicators, okay? You've got new markers and new biomarkers that are constantly coming out, but these are really the ones that are used programmatically and that would be relevant if you're trying to do any policy-based uh, research or research that's going to be relevant towards policy, okay? So I just want to put that out there. So the first thing is really um, the indicators when it comes to biomarkers is understanding micronutrient status and uh, disease, yeah? The, f the first um, one in that, which I'm guessing everybody is familiar with anemia, yeah? Okay, so anemia, of course, is a... Um, is a measure where you estimate the percent of the population, and usually you're looking at women and children, uh, women of reproductive age, you can look at pre in pregnancy, um, young children under five years of age, or you can look under two, and you're estimating the prevalence of anemia. Now, what's the most common measure for anemia? What's the marker that we use for assessing anemia in a national survey? Is there a mic anywhere? Would just somebody speak up loud, huh? Hemoglobin, yeah? So that's exactly a good point. So it's an indicator of anemia, but I think all of you who have a nutrition background are familiar with the fact that a hemoglobin is, is not an indicator of iron deficiency anemia. It reflects both nutritional and non-nutritional anemia, but it's also one of the most field-friendly methods, right? If you are in the field, um, you can assess hemoglobin using, what meter do you use when you assess hemoglobin? If you're in the field, how do you assess hemoglobin? Loudly. No? Kalpana, yes. Hemoq. Um, so yeah, so, I'm, uh, so the hemoq is the most common method. And it, it basically uses capillary blood, which is a finger prick. Um, and you know, there's a method and uh, there's a procedure. And it's, it's very, very simple. And you can do it right in the house, right in the clinic, right in front of the mother and the child and it's very fast. There are some considerations because where you take the blood from is going to change your estimate. So one of the things that I want to leave you with in terms of thinking about biomarkers is you have field-friendly markers, but they not, may not be the most sensitive markers. So when you're choosing a biomarker for an, a biochemical assessment, you need to make that decision based upon what is the purpose of that marker. If you're trying to assess a national prevalence, you're trying to understand, is anemia a problem? Maybe you can go along with the hemoq, particularly if you're going to be working in very remote parts of a country. But if you're trying to do a research study where you're trying to understand what is the burden of iron deficiency anemia, doing a hemoq measurement and hemoglobin isn't going to be enough. You need to bring in other markers of iron, such as you have serum transferrin, you have serum ferritin, transferrin receptors, you have all different types of uh, uh, serum markers that you have to use. And in the case of iron, these are the three ones that are commonly recommended. The second thing I want to sort of bring up when it comes to biomarkers, and you can, this could be any biomarker, but particularly for iron markers, is inflammation. And many of you might have heard this, so this is not new news. Nutrition and inf infection are extremely interlinked. If a child or a mother or anybody, an adult, suffers from an infection, they're going to have an increased need for nutrients, but they're also going to have a decreased intake. And so this sort of cyclical malnutrition, nutrition infection cycle, is something that you are going to see in your markers as well. So for example, serum ferritin is affected extremely by inflammation. And so you have to think about the marker A you're using, and B, is it going to be affected by infection and which direction it would be affected? In the case of serum ferritin, it actually um, it gives an elevated serum ferritin, and then you might mis, uh, miscategorize the level of iron deficiency. So people who might be iron deficient might get classified as iron sufficient. So this is a lecture by itself, but I'm just giving you some snapshots on what you need to think about when you're thinking uh, biochemical markers. Um, the next one that I want to talk about a little bit is 
vitamin A deficiency and supplementation. And I'm sitting in with a whole group of Nepali researchers and academics, and I, th I think vitamin A supplementation is something that you're extremely familiar with and are probably extremely familiar with the biomarkers of vitamin A. So, but this is an important area, as we know that uh, most uh, countries are recommended to provide high-dose vitamin A supplementation, and Nepal has been very successful in achieving high-dose high supplementation of vitamin A. So there are different uh, measures of vitamin A deficiency. And the two things you have to keep in mind is what we use for assessing the prevalence of vitamin A deficiency um, in a population is not the clinical deficiency. Classical nutrition science used to use clinical deficiency, which is night blindness and xerothalmia, and you have people going blind. And, and I think in Nepal, there has been a very high rate of night blindness, and particularly in pregnancy. So the rate of clinical deficiency can be high, but subclinical deficiency, which is very related to mortality, is even higher. Okay? Because what's subclinical is that you're not, the individual is not showing the clinical sign or symptom, but they have already low levels of vitamin A. And that makes them, that it, particularly children under five, that puts them at a very high risk of mortality. So when you're assessing vitamin A deficiency for vitamin A supplementation, what you use is a, a level of vitamin A, which is measured by serum retinol, that is a subclinical level. And it's about, um, there are different uh, levels and cutoffs for pregnant women and for children under five, which are provided in the guide. So I won't go through those. Um, and the last, particular one to think about, and, and uh, I, I question whether we always have this kind of data available, but birth weight, okay? So a measure of maternal health and also long-term infant um, health is birth weight. And birth weight, I want to link this back to your anthropometric markers, is very strongly uh, correlated with height achieved by an infant at two years of age. It's one of the strongest associations that you find in South Asian data. Low birth weight, particularly in Nepal and India, is very high. And that is very highly correlated to stunting. Now, my concern with birth weight is, when do you collect it? This comes, brings me back to the whole issue of data. Okay, so birth weight has to be collected within 72 hours of birth for it to be the, the estimate of birth weight. And that's because infants tend to when they're born, they might be, let's say, eight pounds, and then within a three-day window of three days of birth, they tend to lose weight. So if you really want to capture birth weight, you need to get it within 72 hours. And that's not always easy. Unless it's a facility-based birth, which is particularly a hospital-based birth, you're not going to have an accurate measure. So that's something to think about, but this is a very important estimate. So, and I'm going to move on to one component of IYCF. This, this guide does not cover the complementary feeding, but it covers what are the three measures of breastfeeding. So one is exclusive breastfeeding, continuation of breastfeeding after six months of age, and the initiation. So the first one should be really initiation. Initiation within the first hour of birth. Because the, within the first hour of birth, it, if the woman initiates breastfeeding, it ensures that she's going to continue breastfeeding. It could be within 24 hours of birth because that's still beneficial with the colostrum that the infant gets. But the focus really is on ensuring that mothers put the child at the breast within one hour of birth because the incentive to continue breastfeeding is much higher in those women. Um, the other indicator that we think about when it comes to health and hygiene and sanitation is diarrhea. Again, incidence and treatment of diarrhea would be a very common um, indicator. You are likely to find uh, surveys that do collect this data, but when it comes to diarrhea, it often is self-reported, and that's when it gets a little concerning whether you really need to understand the quality of the data before you use that data. Also, if you're collecting the diarrheal data yourself for your own research or for your own studies, mm -hmm. you have to ensure that you train people who are collecting that data in a way that you know that they're getting um, information that's not biased. 
So, and then between households, when it comes to hygiene and sanitation, of course, the, the source of your drinking water, the quality of the drinking water, that is whether it's clean or not clean, how the drinking water is coming into the household, which is, uh, uh, is it coming, is it an improved water source or an unimproved water source, those things become very important to measure, and often you will find this kind of data in DHS surveys. Um, and lastly, this is again a very big topic that has come up, and this uh, is open defecation, and that's essentially the use of toilets. So the percentage of households that are using or not using a toilet, you can look at it either way, is a reflection of open defecation. Um, you could have an indicator which says, do you have, is there a presence of a latrine? And often you could consider using that, but the thing is to keep in mind that presence of a latrine doesn't essentially lead to use of the latrine. So one has to be very careful in using um, these kind of questions when you want to um, compute indicators such as open defecation. So yeah, so that was my part, and I sort of try to zip through it. I have a few more things that I'd love to say, but I think we would love to have you guys start working on your discussion. So I'm going to pass it off to Will. Thanks, everyone. Excellent. Thank you, Sumani. So we're going to um, complete the menagerie or zoo of different kinds of indicators that you could talk about with just two remaining categories we haven't uh, covered yet, and that is one which is of extreme importance where am I now? Um, for international um, resource mobilization about hunger. When you read in the newspaper that total world hunger has gone up or gone down, the current figure is 825 million or 820 million people in the world who are, quote, hungry. What that number is, is this one. The prevalence of undernourishment that is computed by the FAO in Rome based on a formula that evolved actually from Indian researchers trying to estimate hunger in India and in the 1960s and became the de facto standard for global agencies in the UN system to ask how, how bad is hunger in the world today? So is it going up? Is it going down? Uh, is there a spike? Is there a trend? And this indicator is something that is, uh, a group might want to join and talk about this. So it's entirely possible that you would um, select this. But it's something that has become extremely controversial in kind of Rome-based agencies in the UN system. Uh, and extremely opaque. So it's difficult to see exactly how did they calculate 800 million or 780 million people hungry in the world. Very briefly, the idea is to estimate the total national dietary energy supply from the food balance sheet that we talked about earlier, and then use household surveys to estimate based on total food expenditure that we talked about earlier, to estimate the distribution of that national food supply, what fraction of people would have what level of that uh, national food supply. And then to take demographic data about the age and sex of the population, as well as anthropometric data, data about the height of people, to say, well, this is a society that's mostly children in a very young you know, a population like Nepal, which is relatively young compared to a um, um, country like the Philippines, for example, where the average age is older, or differences in heights, so that a country might that relatively short people as opposed to a country relatively high, high, tall people, to estimate how much per capita energy requirement would be needed to meet daily needs. So in that way, they combine the country level observation of total food supply with the household level observation of, of family income with the individual level observation of heights in order to construct this estimate of how many people are hungry in the country. And then they add up all the countries to get the total national, the total global level of hunger in, in the world. 
And you can imagine this is a complicated formula, which is inevitably quite controversial. If the UN system announces that the, quant the amount of hunger in the world has gone up, that becomes a, a major touchstone for uh, debate and, um, and analysis. So you may want to talk in depth about, about that one. The other kind of category, uh, the, the, the final category of um, indicator is one that has varying levels of attractiveness to varying kinds of groups. And that's the formation of composite or multidimensional indicators that are a mashup, a combination of one measure and another. So I'll just give you a set of examples. The Global Hunter in Index is a composite of just three metrics, three individual indicators averaged together. Global Food Security Index, Hidden Hunger Index, Hunger, uh, HANSI, the Hunger Nutrition Commitment Index, each one capturing a different sort of combination of underlying measures. In each case, you can read about them in detail in the user's guide. Uh, they, they are asking whether we can combine things. So in general, they simply add them up equally. And so most users of these measures tend to be advocates for particular um, outcomes. So they use them as a way of bundling up the outcomes of interest and advocating. As a result, each of these indicators is associated with one institution advocating under one kind of political umbrella for one thing. And they tend not to be used by many others. It's just a, a way in which um, a characteristic feature of multidimensional indicators. So what we have now is eight categories of indicators as combined together in the user's guide. And the challenge is to use your expertise and your interest, the kinds of work that you do using this kind of indicator, to ask the following questions. Have, you, have we categorized them usefully? Is this a, a helpful cataloging and way of describing and talking about measures? What best practices can you identify? What pitfalls can you try to avoid? What policy questions can you inform? What priorities for action? Uh, and, and, and those would be priorities for either researchers, policymakers, or program managers. Okay? So to refresh your memory, I'm going to go all the way back to the list of eight types of, of, of indicators. And the task is to not be too comfortable where you are, but to resort, if you can, around common interests. Presumably, you're sitting together with people who you happen to meet, that you were talking with at lunch, whatever it might be. Um, but if you could have folks who want to talk about group one, national data might be right here. And you could you know, stay in that table or, or go to that table if you are interested in national policy making and you want to talk about and you would just hold up number one and just make sure that at that table you would attract other people who'd want to talk about number one. At another table, you could just write down number two. You'd want to do two, three, four, five, six. And it, if we can do it kind of left to right, that would give you some geography and you would know where to go. Okay? So we won't have equal numbers in all eight groups. And some groups might have no one. Right? Because that's just the way it would happen. But we don't want to impose on you which kind. We also recognize that you may form a group around household surveys, but you actually want to talk a little bit about prices and market data. That's fine, too. The main thing, the real purpose of all this, right, is to have a group of people who can then report back. Okay? So while you're talking, we'll circulate and get a sense of how the conversation is going, but your goal should be to come up with some set of uh, of, uh, of insights about, is this a useful categorization? What are the best practices? What are some pitfalls? And what are some uh, commandments to action for research, policy, and program that your experience has revealed? Right? Because we haven't said anything about actual data, actual findings, um, and so forth. We're just trying to provide a logical framework that can help us talk across different disciplines, different areas, uh, kinds of organizations, kinds of work. Is that a clear path for any questions about 
The idea, okay. So if you could proceed to sort yourselves into common interests, you could, uh, I think people will want to move around because you may not happen to be sitting with people who have that exact interest. And then those who are extremely over with menstruation and deviation for each of them for height for age, for weight for age, and then for BMI for age. So, in a sense, I would, I would suggest we move quickly on to the next question. Yeah, I quite agree with that. Yeah, I like that kind of way of thinking about food security, different types of measures. Mm -hmm. Since anemia is, uh, I don't uh, nutrition anemia is the. Uh, I have, uh, but I have asked how much do you earn? Oh, okay. Yeah. And, and it's a you can all ask question, yeah. but yeah. But since it's household, maybe approximately oh, so three three indicators, and then this practice is out. Yeah. Or does it contain some less than 20 kilocalories or less than 20 kilocalories? But your suggestion is yeah, I'm interested in diet quality. Yeah. So I would suggest yeah, more yeah, confident yeah. in the uh, anthropometric measurement and uh, household in individual recall. Yeah, so I would say but most of the do do the recall and you can. I mean, it sounds like you really want to talk about diet quality. Yeah. Okay, so okay. you just switch the it's basically for the and access. We're going to actually go. This whole session will actually all the way to 315. Okay. Meaning that we'll report back in five minutes. Is that okay? We'll be ready. I think we're being yeah. All right. Let's, let's proceed to learn from, from you and from each other based on the discussions that you've had, the um, main lessons you would draw. I'm going to switch the slide back to the list of, uh, of categories and ask for just a volunteer, whatever table would like to go first, to share their uh, perceptions of the uh, best practices and pitfalls. So back in, in the way back, can you tell us which category you've addressed, what indicators within it you wanted to talk about, and what you found? Dietary diversity, nutrient ad adequacy, and uh, dietary energy intake. So, uh, yeah, that's number two, three, and five. And uh, in this, while discussing best practices, we realize that if we are just sticking to these three indicators, then we cannot uh, say anything about uh, the, our site, uh, the study site. We also need uh, information on the national level and uh, uh, from other uh, out of the eight that we studied, we need the information from other uh, sources too. So, but in these three, the pit major pitfalls that uh, we felt were, so for uh, dietary diversity, it's very difficult, the recall. If you ask me what I had for breakfast yesterday, I'm not going to remember. And if you're having, conducting this survey in a rural area, then uh, it's very difficult to ask them what they had in the previous day. So that uh, we felt was a major pitfall, other than that, you cannot just go to them once and ask them what they ate the last day. You need to go back to them many times. Because somebody might be fasting and somebody might have gone to a party and had a lot to eat. So it's not just a one-time thing. You have to go back. Then there's also the issue of seasonality. So uh, what you eat will also depend on what is available. So there again, you cannot just, we as a team realize that we can't just focus on level three. We do need information from the markets. And what are they cultivating? What are they doing? 
Can we go back to the questions? Uh, it will be easier for me. Yeah. Uh, that, that, the best fact. Uh, yeah, yeah, this one. So then uh, coming to the policy questions. <laughs> so we want to, uh, at, looking at these three indicators, we can look at the nutritional level of that community. There again, we cannot look at it in isolation. The sanitation would be sanitation or the breastfeeding. All of it is related. Coming to number five, it reinforced it further because you're ask, asking us priorities for action that we can identify for research in agriculture, nutrition, and health. So our indicator, uh, number three does not have information on agriculture. We need it from the market or from other levels. Policy making at global, national, and local levels. So we need data from the national level, the country level, to make any, any recommendation. And uh, so, well, basically, what we realized that number three is just not in isolation. It's a whole system. And so program management or project management, it, it is just, you can't just focus on one thing. You have to do a detailed analysis at all levels. We go for the indicators of the anthropometric measurements, it's a, and, uh, which is the, all the five indicators over there. So could you mind changing the slide on that questions? Back to the question. Yeah. Okay, so these are the ones that you're looking <laughs> yeah. at. Yeah, we, we went for the, all the indicators. Well, we choose the anthropometric indicators as we see the NDHS, Nepal Demographic Health Survey data of 2016. 2016, we saw the wasting, staunching, and underweight condition is measurable. That's why we chose that condition based on our work experience. Well, when we talk about the best practices that we recommend in context to anthropomatic, then we saw that it is feasible in community setting. So the community level workers like FCHB, female community health volunteers, too can to can manage a uh, measurement of the anthropometric. Likewise, it is economic, and at the same time, it is uh, multiple measurement can be done at the same time. Example, we can take the MUAC of that children, and at the same time, we can take a JDSCO of that children. So it is, uh, from this point, we can say that it is accurate. Likewise, I want to move on third number, uh, common pitfalls, pitfalls, though they have many best practices, still there are the some pitfalls, like variability in results can be found. At the same time, reliability is low, and it cannot be used for all age group. These are the common pitfalls. While talking about the key policy questions, as we see the growth monitoring card of Nepal, we see there is a wait for age, but since if we add the one component that is height for age, then it would be a fruitful on identification of the chronic malnutrition. How uh, anthropometric measurement can prioritize action for research in agriculture, nutrition, and health? Uh, so uh, from anthropometric measurement, we can like uh, uh, in a certain area we can conduct a research regarding how diversified food. Uh, a certain people of age group of children, uh, pregnant women maybe, uh, you know, uh, they are having uh, diversified food and relating to health. Uh, what can be uh, health, uh, uh, health what, what can be the health conditions relating to the anthropometric measurement, whether the uh, MUAC is uh, good, is in uh, green indicator or not. Uh, similarly, uh, uh, relating to uh, policy making at global and national and local level. Uh, here we have, uh, we have just uh, come into the MDG and we are following the SDG goals. So uh, we can make comparison uh, from what we have achieved from MDG and uh, what we have achieved in the HS, our demographic survey. So comparing to these uh, data, we can make uh, further intervention, for, for the better inter interventions, which can uh, for uh, better anthropometric results. And uh, narrowing down to, uh, to our local levels, we can uh, make proper awareness and uh, awareness conduct uh, better awareness programs for uh, uh, at local levels, uh, like female community health volunteers and health volunteers at uh, various levels. So again, come, uh, for uh, program management view and nutrition and uh, agriculture, there are various aspects we can uh, 
since we are a Suhara team here, uh, regarding agriculture, we can do various things. We can uh, uh, integrate uh, various agriculture items like uh, chicken coops. And uh, yesterday we have learned from the animal uh, here, animal husbandry team that how uh, an egg is important for an individual a day. So we can integrate all these activities, all these ideas together, and but a good help, uh, bring good results. Excellent, and really interesting to see how anthropometry in particular gains this global attention through the SDGs, originally the MDGs, now the SDGs. Uh, it's really something that, you know, the whole world is watching how anthropometry in Nepal will evolve. It's a super important indicator politically. Who'd like to go next? Like the other groups, we thought it was important to look at indicators at all levels, you know, national, community, individual household, and so forth. So we liked that type of categorization. And we spent a lot of our time comparing the three measures of the three market measures. Um, the first one was the um, domestic food price index, which looks at the prices of food in comparison to the prices of all other goods. And then the second one was the food affordability index, which looks at the uh, local food prices in comparison to um, local wages or earnings. And then the last one was the volatility of food prices, which looks at changes in food prices over time. And we pr felt like we preferred the food affordability index best. We thought um, it was a better measure than the domestic food price index because we felt like it's harder to compare different locations in terms of relative relative cost of food to other things because it might just be in one place that the cost of everything is expensive or maybe the cost of cars and clothes goes down but food doesn't really change and so we thought that it was a little bit more relative than um, looking at the wages comparing the cost of food to how much people are earning. Um, so that was the one that we preferred um, and then the volatility we also thought one of the drawbacks is that you know it's more looking historically at changes over time sort of in the past and more of a measure of risk and not necessarily of like a sort of absolute food insecurity. So, um, so we also talked about, I guess, the best practices and pitfalls. We think that data availability is the biggest issue, um, especially collecting data on earnings, collecting data on food prices. Um, I think it's, it's hard to get that kind of information, especially when a lot of people are working in informal sectors and maybe there aren't um, annual surveys being conducted in countries to really get um, information on that. So we think that that was one area that needs more work. Um, and then in terms of policy questions, um, we thought that uh, th this kind of information or measure of food security would be useful for um, thinking about policies such as like um, min minimum wage laws, um, whether people are earning enough to actually afford um, a good diet, um, subsidies for um, different types of food products, government grants and things like that. Um, and then for priorities for action, again, data, um, in terms of programs, also thinking not just about education in terms of what's nutritional, but also thinking about affordability and what pe people can afford and um, those kinds of things. And if anyone wants to add. Surely. Thank you. And yeah, agreeing to what Kithi said, like the, and the best practices is still like, because it looks at the affordability, the food affordability indexes actually looks at your spend, expenditure on food versus your income. So it sort of gives you a relative comparison between your GDP, GNP, your per capita income and your expenditure on food. And to, to be generalizable, you need a, a data of through all over the country, like from different market, as we said, uh, as we uh, saw in the morning, that the food prices, you can't have a national food price. You'll, the food price will differ market to market. So you will have a handful of, um, uh, 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 like a handful of evidence about the food prices in different parts of the country, and you'll have a good comparison about the uh, affordability of food in different parts of countries. So it will guide your policy to focus on which part of country you need to focus on the affordability of food. And, you know, the uh, big chunk of where the big chunk of your earning is going on food. So it will be kind of... Uh, 
among all what we had, it will be kind of a best uh, indicator to predict the food insecurity because the, the expenditure of uh, your earning on the food is directly rela related to the uh, how much food secure you are or how much food insecure you are. So, so far so. Those are really good observations. It's quite striking how that food affordability indicator was something that was of interest in the 1950s and 60s, and then it kind of went away and people didn't track it, but it would be quite interesting in Nepal in particular or other countries to begin to advocate for that to be measured, exactly the data gaps you're referring to about wages um, combined with food prices. We actually took the anthropometry measurement, and uh, we were actually from mostly Nepal and India, so. We actually uh, thought of taking India as a kind of re representative and discuss this. So the first point when we say that uh, well, which categorization of indicators do you prefer, we actually thought of taking stunting, wasting, BMI, and underweight. And uh, stunting to be the major focus because as all of us, we know that uh, uh, 1000 D opportunity, window of opportunity is the biggest opportunity. And after that, when, uh, once the stunting settles, it's very difficult to, it's almost re irreversible. So that is something which we prefer that stunting should be tracked. But at the same time, you must understand uh, to track stunting or to take the data on stunting, it requires highly skilled person. Otherwise, it will be taking the height and the length is always very, very difficult. It's not so easy. So people have to be trained and it has to be taken appropriately. What best practices can we recommend is that uh, generally in India, we lack actually nutrition data. Though, uh, if you go to any state, we hardly find any state level data specifically on stunting and wasting. I'm talking about Bihar, every second child is uh, stunted and every fifth child is wasted. And we get this data after 10 years. We had the last NFHS data, which was in 2005 and 6, and last 2016, we got this data. So you have to take programmatic decision based on the data. And if you have to wait for the data 10 years, obviously the whole programming is at stake. So we request as a best practice that every year it should be taken up so that the policymakers are ready to take actions or say programmatic decision based on this data because this gives you the overall national actually nutrition status. Third is that what common pitfalls would you warn against is that uh, generally, these data, when it collected after five years or 10 years, the indicators sometimes change. So we need to follow a global standard indicator so that every time you collect the data, it is across, you can actually compare the data globally. And you need to know, you need, I mean, you are aware about your standard of that particular state and country. And we, as India is, I mean, quite a big country, it's the, not only state level data, you need to have district level data to take decision. Because diversity is quite various. I mean, there's a huge variation inside the state as well. So you need to have district level data sub-district level data to take a decision based on that. What are the key questions are addressed by, uh, are addressed by this group of indicators? Key questions is basically it takes you, it tells you that what is actually needs to be done. Suppose you say your wasting is 25% or say 20% and severe wasting is 7%. So it'll almost, I mean, a lot of child is actually at the state of mortality or morbidity is quite high in those group of children. So these kind of data tells you that what is the kind of population which is at stake. So this will help you actually take better decision and the government should be ready enough to take those kind of decisions. What priority for priorities for action can you identify? Priority is that nutrition as of now in India is actually talks only, I mean it's uh, uh, given to one particular department, though nutrition, all of us, we know that it's a kind of multi-sectoral approach. And agriculture is something which is actually uh, influencing quite a lot uh, on the nutrition status. But as of now, the kind of linkages with agriculture and nutrition has not been established. So we need to have a multi-sectoral approach and identify actually why there is a variation, why there is a variation in terms of stunting and wasting across different states and across different, different geography or different culture. So we need to identify cultural barriers, we need to identify the kind of food habits, we need to identify what are the kind of rice intensification or wheat intensification, what are the kind of policies or programs which has been supported by to the agriculture department 
for producing one particular crop, why it is not dietary diversity which has been promoted. So it's actually a multi-sectoral approach which is required for this kind of research to identify areas and based on that actually the programming should be implemented. So these are the kind of things which we recommend and basically at the state level or at the national level we recommend that every year at least the data should be available. So dietary diversity which is as I think uh, one of our uh, group also presented, dietary diversity which is a kind of upcoming and new area where everybody is trying to working on. It is again a very challenging area to identify when there is actually availability at the house level but there is no consumption. There is no availability, that is a different issue when the food security is not there. Even if the food security is there, the knowledge is not there to feed the child or to feed the family or to feed the uh, pregnant mother. So there are a lot of nuances to these particular areas. We need to identify those nuances, get into more, I mean, deeper research, identify based on that, actually take programmatic decisions. We covered uh, number three as well, which is dietary diversity indicators in our group. and. Uh, I've been asked to report back because I was the bossiest. And <laughs> uh, so we started off with the question of categorization. Obviously, you've already um, come up with your publication, so we felt it was a bit unfair to ask us whether the categories were the right ones. But uh, we did have some ideas about categorization. We felt that the uh, categorization you have is interesting with having the national, the, um, the markets, and the household, and the individual, and that's useful, but not all the categorization in, that you have actually fits into that, and that you have a few extras which seem to have got added on at the end. Um, also, um, we felt that uh, the categorization would be more useful if it was related to the audience and the users of the uh, indicators, that actually uh, this is something which, when you look at this whole list of indicators, it's very different if you're a researcher with lots of resources to look in great depth than it is if you're a policymaker or somebody who is going to do a very quick survey and that it would be useful to have it a, a tailored to your own needs and to your own decisions. So we had in our group somebody who'd actually just finished doing a website on uh, indicators for this area for food and nutrition security and, uh, and had actually um, a useful set of descriptions for each of those indicators which is, is for users and I'll give a little plug for that. It's called Indicate. So, Indicate.net, is that right? So, uh, those of you who are interested in indicators uh, and some practical experience from NGOs, that's another website you can look at. Um, so, then we went on to the next questions about best practices and pitfalls, which we discussed together, really. And, first of all, we had a bit of a discussion on very general things about household surveys, which uh, help improve the quality of all household surveys, not just these indicators. And they include doing qualitative work to supplement the quantitative work and also doing cognitive testing and other types of uh, pre-testing to, to make sure that your questions are, are good and that are understood by your audience. So those are very general points. Uh, but we also then went on to uh, specific points about these indicators which are Again, the question of seasonality came up, and, and seasonality is, is very important. And we were discussing how seasonality isn't just a question of lean season versus uh, a season of plenty. It's very complex through the year, and that there is big changes even during the lean season when you go. And so uh, this point that the other gr group three brought up is really important for us, I think, is to, to get some kind of market indicator which would allow you to categorize what time of the year you're doing this in more detail than just saying this is the lean season because that's not, that's not uh, good enough. Um, the other thing we talked about was the same thing about timing and recall. We had quite a long discussion about uh, issues of, of the timing being in, incorrect, very much like the other group, uh, whether you'd come the day after they had been on fasting or something, and, and the recall and the difficulties of of, um, uh, the, uh, of uh, interpreting this data, but at the same time, the difficulties of uh, being able to afford to go back over and over to check the data. And the reality of many programs is that you actually have to, you know, only one survey, so how are you going to do this one survey? How are you going to interpret that? So work on validation is very important. We also talked about uh, another indicator that's not on your list, actually, which is the months of adequate, adequate household food 
provisioning, which some of you may know. It's a Fanta indicator, and that, that would be a useful adjunct to some of the indicators on your list. Um, but generally, uh, we felt that even looking at the whole list of indicators, how, how you get a whole picture of the household was quite tricky, and that you have this whole list of things, some of which overlap, and making a decision as a researcher or as a policymaker about which of these indicators is, is extremely tricky. Um, uh, then we went on to the subject of how you would use this for policy and there's a wide range of policies, uh, food and agricultural policies like food subsidies, um, education and uh, knowledge programs, agriculture and gardening programs, obviously it would influence a lot of things. But again this comes back to the issue of the quality of the data and these are mostly in this group, mostly uh, their proxy indicators, quite rapid indicators and the question is are they good quality enough to inform uh, but then if you do, you know, again, it's about the validation and uh, whether that's really good enough. Um, the, uh, the other thing about the indicators that we were talking about was the sensitivity and how quickly they move. And somebody earlier today said to me, uh, the difficulty of a lot of the dietary diversity scores is they don't really tell you something. If you have a vegetable program, for example, um, you're eating a few vegetables at the beginning and a lot of vegetables at the end, your dietary diversity score is not going to change. So is this going to be a useful score? And what, you know, what can you use instead of that to show that you've actually got an increase in your vegetable consumption? So um, this came onto a discussion of sensitivity of indicators and that this should be something which is covered in any, any discussion of indicators is, is how quickly should they move and you, you should get an idea, I have a three year program, am I likely to get a change in this indicator? Um, and I think, f finally, the, the linkages between levels are still very tricky. We have some information at one level and some information at another level. But, you know, okay, you can do a multivariate analysis, but really, uh, you know, is there a really a clear theory about how these levels link up? And, and some more work in that area might be useful. We're getting great insights from each of these really remarkable sort of points being made. I think the idea that this categorization is very imperfect Right, there's no perfect categorization, that's very clear. Um, and so what other group would like to go? Talking about indicator, we, are, I have we have included for the prevalence of undernourishment and undernourishment. Here it carries from individual data, a sex and uh, height, as well as it carries the uh, data from house, household, uh, from consumption and expenditure, as well as, again, in, uh, in this uh, data, other data is also added, like country level data for food balance sheet, and that all uh, sum up to uh, an indicator of prevalence of underinvestment. So, uh, this is the short introduction of our indicator, uh, and what the best practices we have recommended. Uh, actually, in a, in a place context, uh, we have uh, uh, NESCAP as well as uh, DHS and uh, Living Standard Survey, and these all are the some of the surveys that has been uh, done in our context. And in common pitfalls, uh, the amazing is that all the best practices has been turned into pitfalls. Uh, that's the, because of the timeliness. We have a different timeline for the different sources. For example, uh, DHS is carried in every, in every five years. Uh, this, uh, likewise, Living Standard Survey is also carried in every five years, as well as the NESCAP survey is also uh, quarterly. So this timeliness is not concurrent. So when we, dry, when we uh, draw some, in, so draw some uh, inference, then that may have a different finding. This is a uh, pitfall, as well as uh, other is that Nepal, has, Nepal is uh, broadly classified into three ecological zones and uh, generality is a question because Tarai, Him, Imal and uh, Hills, they have a different uh, landscape and uh, productivity. So there may be a chance of ecological fallacy. Uh, as well as uh, other, uh, like there, uh, since it carries lots of indicators, so there may be either while measuring each, uh, each type of uh, sub-indicators, the either is in uh, part, as well as it all, um, this uh, indicator is relies upon the dietary energy. So dietary energy uh, that has been measuring in terms of uh, age, sex, and height uh, in the in our lower setting um, resources uh, that may not be drawn at, at all part. So it is the common pitfalls. Uh, going for the priorities for uh, uh, going for the some like key policy questions. Uh, actually, we have. Um, uh, 
this, uh, this indicator carries from these three uh, sectors like agriculture, health, and nutrition. Yeah, uh, this, this is the its, uh, strongest part, and it also uh, it carries from the all three uh, sectors. The, the, this is a multi sector. I'm talking about the priorities for action now. Uh, here, for, for for the research part, uh, actually, uh, this concurrence of the all indicators is an important part that is for research as well as uh, we can also use other global estimates uh, in order to uh, in order to make uh, like similar decisions uh, for the indicator, and for the policy making, uh, actually. Uh, Actually, it's very difficult for from one indicator to carry out uh, to to make some decision about the uh, po policy. But however, uh, it can be some like you know pragmatic, uh, pragmatic level decisions can be made through the indicator. And talking about the program man management in agriculture and nutrition, this uh, indicator is uh, is based on the interdisciplinary, so it can work some better. Thank you. Thank you. Wanted to give you enough time to talk as a group and then to report back. Um, but that is the last group, so there are a few groups that haven't had a chance to report back, but I feel like we have shared a lot of insights from the groups. Uh, first of all, your discussion within, and then reporting to the others. I really appreciate that. We, as you know, the INDEX project will continue to do its work on the dietary assessment measures, and I hope that every one of you, as you take these indicators into your workplace and your projects and your advocacy work, that you have taken something from this uh, learning lab uh, that you can use directly and over your careers will be really, really valuable. So appreciate that very much, your participation.